Greetings and welcome to part four of our Research 101 series. In the previous episodes, we've covered how to refine a research topic into a research question, the different types of information and how you can use them for research, and ways to query research databases and repositories to access the sources you need. In this segment, we're going to talk about how to evaluate the reliability of those sources. So you've found some sources to use in your project or paper. Great! How do you know those sources are trustworthy? When evaluating sources in an academic sense, we tend to use some basic criteria to determine if the source in question is appropriate to include in our research. There are a bunch of different ways to discuss this criteria, generally using some sort of clever acronym to help you remember. In this case, it's P-R-O-V-E-N for the proven test. But before we get into the details of how to evaluate a source using the proven test, you should understand something. Proven, or any other test for source evaluation, isn't a fixed routine that you can follow by rote and expect to always be able to tell what sources are good and which ones are not. The world really isn't that simple, and even if it was, there's no way you're going to stop and subject every piece of information that comes your way to a rigorous analysis using this method. There just aren't enough hours in the day. So instead, the method we're about to discuss is meant to help you develop a frame of mind for when you look at sources. It's meant to put you in the habit of asking yourself certain questions and to help you stop and think for a moment and reflect on what you're looking at instead of just accepting it. Okay, as with many other methods for evaluating information, the PROVEN test is an acronym outlining six basic areas you should keep in mind when looking at a potential source. These are purpose, relevance, objectivity, verifiability, expertise, and newness. Now, not all of these criteria may necessarily be applicable to each and every source, and how they will be applied to a source may also depend. Just because a source doesn't meet all of these six criteria perfectly doesn't necessarily mean that that source is untrustworthy. You have to balance what criteria apply for a given source and how strongly a source passes or fails that criterion. To explain this, let's explore each of these criteria a little further. The first criterion in the proven test is purpose. Essentially, the question being asked here is how and why was the source you're looking at created? Information sources don't just happen. They're the result of someone composing, gathering, organizing, and publishing something. Sources reflect labor on someone's part, and that labor is going to have a purpose in mind. Of course, there are a variety of purposes behind the creation of information. Some information is created to educate, some to inform, some to persuade, to sell you something, or to entertain you. Sometimes, however, the purpose behind creation of a source isn't so benign. Sources can be created to spread misinformation, to manipulate, to enrage, to terrify, or to otherwise spread untruth. So when we look at a source, we need to consider why it was created, why it was published in the format it was published in, such as a book, article, blog post, social media post, etc., and who is the intended audience for this source. Finally, you might want to consider what emotions, if any, this source is trying to generate in you as you look at it. Is it trying to make you angry, afraid, dismissive of a certain group of people or perspective? Any of these might be a sign that the source in question has been created to manipulate, not to inform. Now, when we evaluate a source based on its relevance, we're basically asking how useful that source is for the question you're trying to answer, and does that source add something new and important to our understanding of the topic in question? This is important because when you're doing research, whether for an assignment in a university class, a project at work, or an issue at home, your time is usually limited. There's a lot of information out there, and a lot of it is very interesting. But if it doesn't have anything to do with the problem you're trying to solve or the question you're trying to answer, then you don't want to waste time with it. In other cases, the source might be on your topic, but it might be too general and provide information that you already know. Or, on the other hand, it might be too advanced and assume a level of understanding on the topic that you don't already have. While both of these sources are technically on your topic, neither of them is helpful for what you're researching, so therefore they also aren't necessarily relevant. The third criterion in the proven test is objectivity. 
When we consider a source's objectivity, we're asking how reasonable or complete the information we've found happens to be, and in particular, we're considering the question of bias. Any form of information created by a fellow human being is going to contain bias of one form or another, as our ideas, opinions, and worldviews are shaped by our individual experiences. And this isn't necessarily a problem. Bias becomes a problem when it affects the content of an information source to such a degree that it calls any of the conclusions that source makes into question. Now we can ask if, a, if the authors present a source thoroughly covering various potential perspectives and interpretations, or if they privilege a particular point of view. Once again, we should keep our eyes open for strong emotional or manipulative language. Also, a major red flag when considering a source's objectivity is if they use language or expressions that appear to be intentionally meant to be offensive. Beyond these signs, we should also consider if the authors, publishers, or sponsors of a particular information source have a particular political, ideological, cultural, or religious point of view. If so, do the authors acknowledge this point of view, or do they try to disguise it? If the source in question has one of these points of view and tries to cover it up, you should treat it with caution and a degree of skepticism. Finally, and this is really important, does the source leave out or mock important facts or perspectives? This may only become clear after considering several sources on any given topic, but if you find a source that either entirely ignores certain facts or perspectives, or openly holds them in contempt, you should ask yourself why, and how this affects the quality of the information they give on that topic. The fourth criterion in the proven test is verifiability. What we're considering here has to do with whether the information source is accurate or truthful, and how can we be sure of that? One of the fun things about the internet is that you can pretend to be whoever you want to be. Want to pretend you're a 500-year-old vampire? Cool! Want to claim you're a time traveler from the year 3000? No problem. Want to claim you're a doctor and hand out medical advice to people with serious health problems? Oh, wait... So when we encounter information online in particular, it becomes crucial to be able to verify the things that are claimed. There are a couple ways to verify the accuracy of an information source. Do the authors of the source support their claims with factual evidence? Do they actually cite those sources so you can look them up? This is actually one of the reasons citations are so important, because without a way to check the facts of a claim, you'll have a much harder time verifying it. Next, are there recognized experts on this topic? If so, what is their position on the claims being made by this information source? Do they agree, or is their position substantially different from those claims? We can also look at the source and consider its internal consistency. Does it contradict itself? Does it make claims that we know are false from previous readings? Does it misrepresent its sources, incorrectly identifying them, or claiming expertise for someone who doesn't have it. Finally, are there significant errors in the source, such as spelling, punctuation, or grammar, that suggest it hasn't even been copy edited? Any of these can be a major red flags that the claims made by the source are not verifiably accurate or true. The fifth criterion in the proven test is expertise. In general, when we ask about expertise, we're asking if the person who created this information knew what they were talking about and whether we're able to determine that based on their background and experience. Now, it's important to recognize that there are a lot of different forms of expertise out there. In academia, we tend to defer to someone's degree, discipline, and area of specialization. So, someone can have a PhD in physics and, a, and be a recognized expert in the area of quantum physics. But that's only one kind of expertise constructed through years of study and experience. A plumber, who has been in the trade for 30 years, also has experience, as does the clerk at the DMV, or the guy grilling the carne asada for the tacos you may be having for dinner later. All of these forms of expertise are valid within the areas in which they are relevant, but they don't generally transfer into other areas. For example, you probably don't want your taco guy to try and solve your issues at the DMV, or have a physicist fix your pipes. So how do we determine expertise? Well, a lot of that depends on the question you're trying to answer or the problem you're trying to solve. 
as we just noted, expertise is contextual and only applies in certain areas. That said, the most important tool out there for helping you determine expertise when considering academic questions is peer review. This is a sort of quality control for academic publishing that controls what gets published in scholarly journals. The peer review process goes something like this. A scholar in a given field submits a manuscript of their research to a journal in their field for publication. That manuscript is given to other scholars in that same field, the author's peers, if you will. These scholars look over the submitted manuscript and determine if the work the scholar has done is accurate and well-reasoned, if their background research is comprehensive, and if their methodology is sound. At the end of the process, there are three possible outcomes. The paper can be accepted for publication without revision, which is rare, but does happen. Or the paper can be sent back to the author with a series of suggested edits to make to make the paper ready for publication. Or the paper can be rejected for not meeting the standards of publication. Either way, only the research that passes review gets published in scholarly journals. This is why your professors often ask you to use peer-reviewed articles in your research papers and projects, because they know that these articles have been written by experts and submitted to expert review before they could be published. The last criterion in the proven test is newness. Now, information is generally not static. It changes over time. These changes come for a variety of reasons. In the case of news sources, reporting moves fast, and news that was breaking this morning and full of uncertainty might be heavily covered old news by this evening. Sometimes our ability to observe and measure phenomena increase due to technological advances. Thus, our knowledge of astronomy has advanced considerably between what Galileo could view in the sky with his homemade telescope in the 1600s and what the Webb Space Telescope can see from orbit today. In some cases, our understanding of biases, both implicit and explicit, has also grown over time. For example, much of the earliest work done in the social sciences, like anthropology, psychology, and sociology, are shot through with the cultural assumptions of the late 19th and early 20th century, and thus include ideas that today we would classify as racist, sexist, imperialist, or homophobic. While this doesn't mean that this research is useless, it does mean that we need to be careful when using it and not accept its arguments uncritically. For all of these reasons, when doing research, we tend to prefer newer and more recent research or reporting done on a topic over older scholarship which may be biased or out of date. Now, what does older mean when it comes to scholarly sources? Well, that depends on the discipline. A 20-year-old history article might be fine. Well, a 20-year-old psychology article is probably out of date, and a 20-year-old computer science article? Forget about it. So when you're looking at your sources, don't forget to ask yourself, how and why was the source created? Is this source useful for answering the question I'm asking? Is the information I'm looking at reasonable and complete? Can I tell if this information is accurate or truthful? Did the people who created this information know what they were talking about? And is this the most up-to-date information on this topic available? Of course, all of this can be complicated, and it takes time to develop this skill. So if you have a source that you're not sure about and would like a second opinion, feel free to ask your subject librarian. They'll be happy to help you. Thanks for watching.